Hi, Cam. <laughs> Hi, Irina. How are you? I'm great. I'm great. It's always episode? wonderful to meet once a month. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Not every day. <laughs> Not every day, but once a month is. <laughs> So, uh, currently, our whole situation, it's quite, looks very tough, uh, even though Brunei is having um, very low infected, in fact, zero, in fact, zero, but your neighbor is quite giving you some tense, I think, <laughs> our neighbor, which is so, my, so, my uh, Bruna so had Bruna had three, the last, which came in about, uh, about 100 days later. Mm -hmm. And um, two has been released. We still just have one coming in. Uh, mostly not infected locally, but coming in from outstation. But you okay. know what? Your neighbor yep. left. My Our neighbor <laughs> left and right is asking us to open borders. And we say we're not ready. <laughs> Limbang is stuck in between. Uh, and yeah. Laos is stuck. But Laos is okay. But Limbang is stuck in between. So they're going beyond Brunei borders into yeah. the... Uh, uh, the forest areas and the jungle areas, they are the landscape to go back home. So for our audience uh, who just joining us, you know, we just like updating each other in our current pandemic situation. So it looks like the border is quite hard to open, yeah, at this situation. I mean, we're already in October now, but I think we need to face the facts is, you know, it's still not safe yet, you know, it's still not safe yet because... The outbreak, I mean, the pandemic, the the coronavirus can could be just because of you know one big event, and then suddenly it's the number have increased already. So I think, oh, in I one think hopefully, aircraft. yeah, hopefully next year because I think every country now is fighting to raise up the capacity on, you know, so long we can provide some good medical treatment, you know, or some preventive measure. Then I think everybody used to the new SOP, the new normal. Then I think that will be the time that we can slowly, you know, opening up the borders. Yeah. But for SIGA position, whatever it is, you know, don't just wait for the border to open, right? We have to ready ourselves also as a frontliner. Even though now we couldn't get much job, you know, or we running zero assignments. You know, some of many of us, but doesn't mean we give up, right? We still need to upgrade ourselves. And I think this month, the discussion of the topic is very important. Uh, why is important? Because without the pandemic, without the coronavirus, also uh, COVID-19, I think we also having trouble because uh, this month, our topic is about the word UNESCO, right? So we're talking about World Heritage uh, Sites, like listed under the uh, UNESCO. Yeah, so even though without the pandemic, you know, most of the site is in danger and um, every country is fighting, you know, they put a lot of efforts and also a lot of um, hard works to finally to get the inscribed, you know, as the World Heritage Site. But sometimes because of our mismanagement or because of like people always blame tourism, you know, bring the negative impact. So I think this is why we want to discuss, you know, about this uh, UNESCO uh, topics. But what about Ken? I mean, I always fascinating to visit UNESCO site, you know. Whenever I search the country, first thing I would like to know, like, uh, whether this country have UNESCO sites or not, <laughs> or UNESCO, any UNESCO status. What about you? I love UNESCO sites. Uh, I think <laughs> that's what we're chasing for. Uh, but Bruna has no UNESCO sites, but we have a national heritage. Going mm. off, uh, most travelings, you know, we have close to how many thousand UNESCO sites, yeah, in the world. Yes. So everybody, yes, everybody's chasing their UNESCO sites. While you yep. look at UNESCO sites, they're divided into uh, several categories, from natural to cultural. It, yes. it can be in nature itself, in and above, in, or shall I say, in water, above water. It can be from national parks to even your food. Yes, yeah, so correct. each different people look at it differently. Yeah, I think we can quickly run through. We can quickly run through. I think now we have uh, some slide to share. So basically, we have actually um, two types of uh, heritage. One is called the cultural and natural. So currently, we are focusing on cultural heritage first. So which is the tangible. So what Cam just like uh, share with us from the tangible heritage, we have divided into 
immovable cultural heritage, which is like what Cam just mentioned, right? Modern moms, archaeology oh, site, heritage building. Then we go to the movable cultural heritage, such as like painting, sculpture, etc. Then you talk about just now the word underwater, right? What above water, underwater, but underwater cultural heritage is the one that we're referring like shipwrecks. So I think Brunei <laughs> just outside your uh, your offshore, uh, which is very close mm -hmm. to Labuan, which is also yeah. uh, one of the world federal, I mean, sorry, the federal territories for Malaysia. So we have... Um, a famous uh, ship wrap also, but unfortunately not yet been inscribed. You know, not yet yes, been inscribed. Correct. Yeah, <laughs> as a UNESCO, but it's under tangible heritage. Yeah, it's under tangible mm -hmm. heritage. And then I think we also have like, can we move on to the next slide? Uh, intangible heritage. I think this is the most challenge. I think uh, Cam will be agree with with me, right? Intangible heritage. Yes, correct. So yeah, intangible because, heritage, we have dances. Yeah. Dancing, yes. oral, uh, performing arts, oral tran uh, translation or oral uh, traditions. It can be through songs. It can yep. be through poetries. Yep. Yes. And that's how they talk about their, could be for us Brunei, our sultans. Could be for yes. places like Laos and all this, uh, or Thailand. It could be their kings. Because yes. for most of us in Asia, we have rulers who are sultans, kings, or um, they, uh, they call it as... Um, the empire of something, if you yep. look at it. Yeah. And the fascinating us most is, I think, besides you mentioned about oral tradition, performing arts, but the word ritual, you know, ritual. Yes, yeah. So I think um, if I'm as a visitor, if I go to some country, I can experience some uh, ritual, such as like to understand their worship, to understand their the uh, birth, wedding and funeral rituals, I think will be quite fascinating about right because that is yes, really correct. you learn about the local culture <laughs> yeah and and, so, and, and, yeah. and also not to forget that even though we have local culture this local culture also broken into little groups for yeah. us Brunei we call them as puak or little mm -hmm. indigenous groups so they fall yeah. into these groups doing certain things like for us weddings certain weddings in certain areas they wash their feet during the wedding, yeah. it is a ceremony, a ritual. And we also yeah. see uh, in some places paganism yes. when they are doing certain things uh, to celebrate some things, especially during farming period. Yeah, yeah. things like that. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Then we can move on to the next slide. So, so, so we will see that this is a natural heritage. Like we mentioned, like World Heritage. If you go to the UNESCO ORG, okay, their website, the the official website, you can always Google like cultural heritage, and also the next is natural heritage. So, in the natural heritage, uh, I think that is also another big challenge. Because uh, to maintain a natural heritage site has never been easy. <laughs> yes. Especially currently, we have to fight with the climate action. You know, we are fighting with the climate action. With all sorts of pollution and mismanagement, and that's why we lost a lot of heritage, natural heritage sites as well. Yeah. Okay. Right. So I think we're going to quickly also look into um, some of the... Uh, when. I think most of you might be uh, feeling the interest, like how actually all these cultural heritage or natural heritage sites been chosen. So is it like because of the scenery or because of what is so special about them? So in the UNESCO, they have this criteria for the selection, which is use the word outstanding universal value. So in short, we like to call it OUV. Okay, O U V. So for many tourists or many visitors, maybe you didn't realize, right? Because when you visit the heritage site, you just look into like, oh, this is a UNESCO heritage site. <laughs> okay, where there's culture or nature. <laughs> so you didn't bother, actually bother to understand like why being inscribed. But today I think me and Cam, we want to look into it a little bit so that in the future, when, when we visit the UNESCO site, we have a little more attention on all these OU, yeah? And I think, Cam, you also ready some um, good example and good experience, right? Later, you want to share with her. Huh? Yeah. Okay, so that's great. So let's go through the uh, six cultural criteria. So total for the outstanding universal value is 10. 
But for the cultural, whether it's tangible or intangible, they are looking into only the six. So for UNESCO requirement, it's very simple. So long we fulfill one, if we can make sure that we fulfill one criteria, that will be inscribed. But by fulfilling one, sometimes it might took you for like years and a yes. lot of efforts and a lot of money for investment, excavation and etc. to finally come out this uh, thick book. <laughs> Just to mention on why is it so outstanding about this heritage, whether cultural heritage or natural heritage. So we just have a quick run only. Uh, one is to represent a masterpiece of human creative genius. So the, I think most of the heritage site now you will see is a monument. Then that will be usually or a piece of a masterpiece of a building that will all fall in the criteria number one. Then I think most of the uh, good example like today when uh, later I think um, Cam you're going to share your favorite one of your favorite uh, UNESCO site which is Laos right at Laos right in yeah, Long Pabang. Laos. Yeah. So in yeah. Long Pabang, you have the criteria number two right uh, and then yep. in Malaysia uh, for the uh, our historic cities for the street settlements here historic city Georgetown and Malacca. Uh, old town of the Malacca, which is we also have the criteria number two. And the interesting is you if you look at the criteria number three is to bear a unique or at least exceptional testimony to a cultural tradition or to a civilization which is civilization. living. Yeah, which is living or which has disappeared. So this is number three that I, I believe that in Luang Pabang, right? In Luang Pabang, the UNESCO city, they also fulfill criteria number three as well. Uh, and uh, for the number four, to be an outstanding example of a type of the building, architecture or technological assemble or landscape with the illustrates significant stages in the human history. So I guess like, uh, I strongly believe that, you know, Luang Pabang have that criteria number four. So same thing as Correct. our historic city like Malacca and Georgetown too. And I think number five and number six is not easy to fulfill because if you look at number five, to be an outstanding example of a traditional human settlement and land use or CU which is representative of a culture or human interaction with the environment, especially when it has become vulnerable under the impact of what? Wow, that's too small. <laughs> e, what? Irrever Inter irreversible change. Yeah, irreversible. Change. Yeah, irreversible yeah, change. Exactly. Oh, I think this is quite tough. Uh, I think it's very tough, you know, to fulfill this criteria. And I think number six also uh, directly. Yeah. But Long the Prabang met the criteria for the, the number five. Oh, the unique, wow. uh, Yes. If okay. you look at it. <laughs> Great. And then to be directly, tangibly associated with the events or living tradition, with the ideas or with the belief and with the artistic and literary works of the outstanding universal significant. I think this is mostly with referring to the living heritage, which is another, uh, remember, like just now we talk about the intangible heritage. I think that is very, very tough because sometimes it's, uh, not easy to keep that tradition for more than hundred years, you know, due yeah. to many due to many changes or many other impacts, it could be just disappeared like that. So it's not easy. Yeah, urbanization. Yeah. yeah. But I think for, for Cam in your country, Brunei, even though now it's not yet to be ready for the UNESCO, but I think you have a potentially, especially your national park, I think, right? Your national park. Our you national have park, some yeah. yeah. Some of our local uh, dishes can be put mm. in there. Some of our uh, motives for weaving are mm. really good uh, to yeah. be part of UNESCO site. Um, I, 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 I'm not site, uh, I, I UNESCO item, but we have yet to go through all the processes. Yeah. So now we will next go into um, looking at the natural heritage site now. So although natural heritage site for the criteria is only four, seven, eight, nine, ten. 
Yeah, it's only foresight. But I think um, to, to me, that natural environment is sometimes it might be destroyed by the natural disasters also. And then I think yes. with the climate action now, it's getting us uh, more challenging. So I think today you will share another site is Mulu National Park, right? Yeah, Gunung yeah. Mulu National Park. Yeah, you, you Which choose. Which is close to home. Back. Yeah, you choose because it's very close to you. <laughs> yes, correct. It's only about yeah. uh, two hours drive from here to go down to Sarawak or Miri. And it's another hour plane drive. Uh, plane yeah. Ride. yeah. In fact, in fact and Mulu is also. Mulu is also my favorite also. You know why? Because yeah. I, when when I first look at Mulu, I find it amazing because it fulfills all the criteria here. <laughs> yes, Seven, correct. Eight, ten. <laughs> and it's managed very well. Yeah. Very well so, managed by uh, um, the, the people who are involved with it and also the local community who puts a hand in helping out. Hmm. So I don't know, maybe you can consider your national park and in Brunei or you have a you have a very nice national park. Maybe you can consider yeah. like which criteria you want to fulfill. So long as one, you can work for yes, it. Right. <laughs> yes, I should fight yeah. for it. <laughs> yeah. You see, like Singapore, Singapore is just uh, recently, I think two years ago, if I'm not mistaken, they just got uh, one UNESCO site because of their botanical garden. Because of the yep. Singapore Botanical Garden, yeah. But that one is under really? cultural heritage. It's not because of natural heritage. It's under cultural heritage for Botanical we Garden. Have a, we have a heritage which is under the ASEAN heritage. Mm -hmm. uh, it is called, it is a lake whereby the, the water, the leaves in the water, which comes down from the trees are brown. So it has a tannin color. Yeah, mm -hmm. if you look at it. And why it yeah. became a national, uh, an ASEAN heritage is also because they found a little bit, I think not bigger than of thumb. Yeah. Okay. So that's why it became, uh, you know, it became recognized as an ASEAN heritage. You never know. We can change that. Yeah. Or we yes, can have yes. both an ASEAN yeah, and true. UNESCO heritage. Yes. True, true, true. But anyway, all these criteria is just basically for your reference. Yeah. So you yeah, feel free right. to just go to Google on the UNESCO ORG. They will have all the 10 criteria as a guideline for you. Okay. Mm -hmm. And um, now we are going to move on to give some good example or some good experience, or maybe we want to comment something, you know. Uh, so I think today I'm going to let Cam start first uh, with her experience in the one side in the cultural heritage and another side as a natural heritage yeah so we're going to start cultural so, heritage first yeah. yes so i fell in love with this town up on mm -hmm. a little peninsula very high you know in a mountain it's called long prabang uh i, I mean that's where we met Ar arena too for the third time and we stayed on quite close to two weeks yeah arena and yeah, we did some training we, down there yes you remember i yes. um convinced uh, all our trainers that we have to do our mm. training there because I told yeah. you it's not only the outstanding universal value, but I really uh, compare to most of the world right. heritage sites in Southeast Asia. They are very, to me, is they are very unique. They are really unique. Yeah, because <laughs> of the, the fusion of traditional architecture and the urban construction, yeah, structures. Mm that you can see from the 1600 meeting with a newer uh, colonial look which is from mm. the 19th and 20th century uh, and the best thing about it even though they, they, they still preserve it you can see from the building itself from the road and what is very important is they preserve the uh, the townscape the townscape still looks fantastically new and very very clean and you know what the cleanliness is the one which caught my eye it was oh, so clean yeah the yeah. cleanliness yeah so the you know this is the best um it has a blending of the two distinctive culture which is their own culture and the uh intervention of the newer uh colonial people who came in yeah so mm. one of the things i like about uh, long prabang uh if you look at it are uh, the what's or all the um um what do you call this as the the pagodas I would say mm. they're like land of pagodas. The yep. first few days, I was already hiking up Mount Pushi. <laughs> and Mount Pushi is so fantastic. Um, 
I think also Long Prabang used to be um, the home of a lot of royalties during those period. So they yeah, come they down here. Mm. Yeah, it is a kingdom by itself because also the the weather itself it does a lot mm. of preservation in this area. If you mm. look at it, um, and and uh, if you look at the criteria, it has the assemble of all the sanctuaries combining sophisticated architecture of religious building. The building yeah. itself is really, really, you know, we spend hours inside and outside the building and I'm just at all with it, yeah? Uh, the the way the tradition of the people, the way they speak, the way they bend, the, the inscription that you see in some of the walls makes you wonder, okay? Um, if you look at it also, um, it's preservation and it's a blending of these two cultures which help people to want to go there they are, they are traditional, but they are modern in a way. You know what? Mm. We even have nice bakery if you look at it. But it is next yeah. to it. You have the local people selling their local bakeries, but they also yeah. come up with traditional massages that you look. That's what makes Long Prabang different. Yeah. And um, yeah, I, I think basically, um, you know, the early, early morning prayer that the monks come up uh, mm. to come up for their alms. For people to, you know, uh, yeah, yeah, arms giving. I mean, we woke up at three plus in the morning just to witness it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because you I want mean, the experience as a mom. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So you look at it, the values are there, the traditional values, they believe in things that you got to respect your monks. It is mm. just like us in Brunei. Uh, you respect your, you know, your religious officers or those people, uh, your imams and your uh, Bilal and all, all, all these people. So that's what I like about Long Prabang. Besides mm. all that, um, it's also they still have traditional food. that You see, mm. the marketplaces is very unique. You see a yeah. lot of things in the market. Mm. That's why one of the training I had, I had to share about uh, the marketplace whereby everybody can come in and you can get anything. Basically, mm. a lot of these things are still the traditional food. They yep. even do, do traditional things from, you know, uh, we saw how they do riverbed seaweeds. Yep. Yeah. And these are all uh, traits that we have that yes. they do and they still go through generations. This is the uniqueness about uh, UNESCO, you know, yep. putting everybody, reminding people that we still have to keep to our heritage. Correct. Yes. And I think this is also the reason that uh, when Luang Prabang was being inscribed in 1995, they have mm -hmm. actually fulfilling criteria number two, number four, and number five. So not yeah. it's only about the traditional building, which is they have a, a lot of wooden mm -hmm. structure. I think you yes, agree with me. It's like fantastic yeah. in the cool zone. Most of the houses, they still maintain yeah. it well. And I think yeah. next is also they have a strong influence from the French colonial. Right. So just now you that's mentioned right. yeah. like a little bakery, that's very French style. Okay. And then you can yes, see some right. yeah, you can see some cement building also very French. So it's like giving us a very mixed culture. One culture is like very uh in the Asian, which is wood, yes. forest, you know, then suddenly we have like a little bit modernization, like you know the strong influence from French, and then most of them they can uh, even speak French because once upon French. a time their language is French. Yeah, so I think with and this mixed culture, yeah, make it very rich. Mm -hmm. Then you mentioned yes, about yes. like uh the living heritage, like the traditional on their belief, even though they have been like uh, as a Western colonial for a period of time, but it doesn't mean yes. they change. You know, yeah. No. So yeah, to them, uh, yeah. Traditional uh, traditions are still uh, inbred in them. They don't yeah. get too influenced by outside. Might be yeah. the younger generations, but the older generations are there to stay to teach, to teach the you know uh, younger de generations. And also, yeah. part of it is they do a lot of weaving. Yeah. yeah. Yes, a lot of weaving. Traditional trade. Yeah, traditional method. You know, yeah. yeah. Mm. Just to let you know, I'm into my third week of weaving. Mm. Long Prabang has actually opened my eyes to see how beautiful uh, weaving can be done into different mm. design motif. And you must not forget also the natural colors which they use from the tree, the leaves, and the flowers. Yes. Remember all the, the day colors. that we were boiling water to get purple. Yes. 
yeah. <laughs> to get brown yeah. colors and, yeah. and things like that. I think um, it is just right that Long Prabang is actually recognized as a you know a UNESCO site for cultural yeah, UNESCO Nicole, site. I think I think I agree with you. Like um, it's sometimes building itself architectural. You can admiring mm. for like maybe ten minutes or mm. half a day. It's good yes, enough, right? Yes. Yeah, but but the local the living, yes. yeah, the strong, yes, that I think that the that experience. is the part. That, yes, that is the part that really amazed. Just like um, one of my uh, visit to Vietnam today, I choose Hue An. Okay, you choose Rong Pa Bang to be uh, a topic to you discuss, and I choose Hue An. Actually, when I first get to know Hue An, uh, it's not because of as a UNESCO city, I was I was actually in um I was actually in a what it call like a like a, a training, and um, I was like amazed on like even Hui An, even though it's inscribed as 1999, but actually they are facing a uh, great challenges because of so famous and so well known until the control capacity was overloading. And it become danger for the World Heritage Site. So that was actually catching my eye. And uh, when I learned about this uh, Hue An, it's at the central of Vietnam. And when I look at it, it reminds me because in my home country, Malaysia, we have Malacca and Georgetown. And uh, being inscribed as a World Heritage Site only in the 2008 at that time, but Hue An was in 1999. So I would say like Hue An is one of the successful model to representing the criteria on, if I'm not mistaken, is I think Hue An fulfilled criteria number two and number five, okay? And where else for Malacca, we have more than, we have like two, four, and five. So what happened was um, when I see Hue An, it tells me about like how oh, finally I understood how Malacca looks like. Because Malacca start been changing is after 1985. Okay. But Hue An until today, they still have well preserving, uh, especially their shop houses. Because um, why? Because there is a very southern Chinese style in the old architecture. And uh, of course, with the over the years, because Hui An is have been established. I mean, the city was exist since in the 15th century. It was already a melting pot. So um, you can see, like Hui An is one of the uh, very important uh, trading port for the east and also for the west, and also connecting very well with the Southeast Asia. And uh, until today, you will still see the structure of the uh, the house along the Hui An. It that. Its mainly purpose is not a kingdom. It's not like a royal town, like Luang Prabang. It's very different because it's mainly for businesses. So people who come in with the big ship and they have to go through the canal and coming into the this little town just very close by the coastal area. So by coming into the canal and then you're going to see like small little boat, that's all the shop houses were facing the main road and their backyard, which is the canal. So that is where it's easily for them to load in. So if you happen to visit Malacca and then you will understood what I mean the same, even though today the canal doesn't, the mm -hmm. river, the Malacca river is, doesn't look like river at all. And most of the shop houses had changes. Now we become like cafe and hotel and so on. But traditional business is hard. So when I look at, uh, I still remember like about two years ago, uh, I would say that the first visit to Hui An, it should be 2016. Yeah, it's 2016 when I first visit Hui An. And uh, it reminds me like if the management plan do not do well, then we're going to lose, you know, uh, our trading port status, which is now I look at Malacca in 2020. Uh, this is my worry now, <laughs> okay? Because when the UNESCO site, you change to be so popular and this is will be like... Tourism. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's why people will blame on tourism, you know. People will say, oh, because of tourism, then age and, and so on. But looking at that way, preserving the architecture, it's definitely it's really helpful because tourism really helpful on preserving the buildings, right? Because we need the authentic, the authentic feeling. So that's not going to change much. And then the landscape. The landscape definitely will 
well preserving well because otherwise if we change the landscape the township plan then it's going to be like oh this is not ancient city anymore right <laughs> but the only thing we couldn't uh take it for long or couldn't preserve it well is which is the living heritage the traditional way of living so that is why when i see Rompabang, you know and hui an mm. you know I got a very mixed feeling, you know, I got a very mixed feeling. I love Hoi An. It's a very nice city, nice town to visit, you mm -hmm. know. But at the same time, that you will feel like you just you just don't see the 15th century to the 19th century. What are the real local culture? You know, mm -hmm. not that already now. Yeah. It's, it <laughs> reminds me of Malacca, actually, as you were saying earlier, whereby yeah. the river is now used for That's tourism for only. Tourism. Mm. So the Correct. other day when last December I was down there, we even saw a wedding going down the river. And it's just <laughs> like another group was doing karaoke down the river. So in the past, I I must assume that in the past, people were fishing down that river. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yes, definitely. Fishing, that's yeah. what, yes, that the same thing that you see in Penang. And yeah. you say and changes are nice, but you see new murals coming out. The older mm. buildings are coming down. And people yes. are... Think yes. more money, yeah, because <laughs> money is one of the destruction of cert certain areas. That that that's why. Because um, I'm not so sure about you, uh, Irina. I've been to Nepal, and mm. Nepal has one of the most uh UNESCO site. You come in from one side, you're next to the other side. So what they yeah. do is they start charging people, and when oh. that's why a little fee is required for certain places. For yep. entrance fees, yep. it helps to maintain the place. So some yep. people say these are sites you don't need money. These are natural sites, but you do need them to keep cleanliness, to maintain. It could be the boardwalk, could be yes, to maintain correct. anything. So please yes. bear in mind, we need to pay a bit for what we want to stay longer. All we right? can call it this fees as like conservation fees, okay, yes, to correct. conserve the site so that the whatever they proposed by the management plan, they could um able to, you know, keep sustaining it, you know. But at the same time, sometimes you will find some UNESCO site uh, like they charging. But charging, but you feel, uh, you feel like, why do you pay that money? And you still mm -hmm. don't see the site being well preserved. I think that yes. that is... Not like you're feeling hurt it's not the issue you don't want to pay you wish to pay but you want to see they really okay. preserve and conserve the site you know <laughs> then you you feel like, like okay case. yeah yeah so tourism is yes. good in the way like we can contribute money for conservation and preservation also like in malacca and penang uh, we have like a accommodation we charge some certain fees you know uh, going yes. per night just to make sure for mm -hmm. the you know, especially like for the the rubbish, you know, for the mm -hmm. management on the uh, maintaining the whole heritage site. So I think I'm 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 perfectly all right, fine. Because if you're doing in yeah. a good way, yeah. So I think Sorry. we're going to move on to another interesting, which is the natural heritage sites also, right? So uh, you're going to choose uh, Mulu National Park. <laughs> Mulu, yes. Yeah, great, 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 Mulu. great. Mulu. Uh, Mulu National Park actually has uh, four criteria that you look at it. So they were inscripted in the year 2000. So with the National Park, you have, um, uh, based on the criteria of number seven, um, it's natural beauty that they have, you know, with yeah. primary and, you know, the terrain itself, if you're, you've been up there, it's oh, wonderful. And they have waterfalls and they have largest caves on yeah. earth. Uh, on Earth, if you look at it, uh, it stretches up to 600 meters and 450 yeah. meter wide and 80 meter high. I think I can put a house, more than a house there, <laughs> several airplanes if you look at it. Uh, mm. If you look at it also, uh, so they have clear water cave and things like that. So it also met with the criteria number eight, which is the mm. part, um, major changes in the Earth history, the, the rock formation that you, you see down there. Uh, from Mulu um, formation um, and then it, the limestone itself and the sandstone itself that you have down there uh, and it goes all the all the way to the summit if you look at it you you'll be walking up into the pinnacles when you're up in Mulu itself and these are really the view is really 
Amazing. You see, I'm dreaming already. Time to open the borders. <laughs> <laughs> I think if we look at it. Yeah, I think with this pandemic, everybody is looking forward natural yes. side. You know, go to the natural heritage you know, side. <laughs> yes, but you know what? I love what that the pandemic has done. It has increased people coming to my house because you know I run a homestay, and I yeah. help people to get connected with things which is around the riverbed. So anyway, okay. uh, we look at those caves, and then we have the property. Uh, scientifically, people do. have a lot of studies in Mule Caves from the flora and the fauna of the cave. And, you know, um, it's so diverse. There are close to 3,500 species in uh, Mulu itself. 1,700 mosses. <laughs> to me, all mosses look the same. Okay. <laughs> and liverworts and, you know, 4,000 species of fungi. Imagine, you know, when Martin was there with me, we have to stop nonstop. Because he was mm. busy admiring all those little fungi and thinking, can we eat this? Can we eat that? Yeah. And I said, yeah. no, yeah. We'll, we'll leave it as it is. <laughs> and they <laughs> have, you know, 20,000 invertebrates, 81 species of mammals, if you look at it, mm. 270 species of birds. But to me, all birds look the same, except for the hornbill and a couple few which I love. 55 species of reptiles, 76 species of amphibians, 48 yep. species of fish, bearing mm. in mind that some of the fish are also in the cave, the underwater mm. cave. So yep. some people say these fish could be blind. They oh. have no eyes. So how do they see things? By vibration <laughs> of the water. Yeah. Mm. So the next criteria, if you look at it, um, support the, the richest uh, assemblage of flora to be found. We spoke about that in high, uh, high al altitude. Uh, they also have a uh, species of palm species um, yep. with natural habitat. Um, one of the largest colonies of, you know, bats. You've been there, you know, where can you find people going out for bat sighting? People yeah. wait at five o'clock outside the cave just to wait for the bats to come in and admire it. In a yep. normal way, people run from bat. But this one, everybody's <laughs> waiting, waiting for the bats to come out. And they come yeah. out in hundreds of thousands flying out. I think yeah. that's why it became so famous because of the species that you can find. And mm -hmm. also they have swiftlets, birds, mm. yeah, flying at night or during the day. So a big colony of them. So if you look at it, so they've covered everything from the formation of the rocks, from the caves, the animals, yep. and then the flora and fauna. I think Mulu has done a fantastic job. Yeah. I don't know when was your first visit to Mulu. Sorry, which year? Oh, I can't remember. Uh, <laughs> my last visit was about four years back. No, four the first visit. from because it been inscribed as uh, been inscribed as in two thousand. So, did you visit before two thousand or after two oh, thousand? No. After that. So oh, you the facilities around that, as we were talking earlier, we pay for, you know, entrance fees. But they also, the best thing about UNESCO site is like this particular one, they train mm. their guides. Mm. So their guides are very knowledgeable and they're packaged together into what, as you go out into some of these walks. Mind you, the walks are really long around here and you yeah. need to be guided uh, within the park because it's, about 52 uh, hectares, 52,000 hectares, yeah? With, you know, it's so huge that yes. you might lose your way, okay? <laughs> okay, of course, definitely. So you choose Mulu. Actually, Mulu is my favorite site, but I'm more luckier than you because I visited in 1998. That was oh, my first before... visit to Mulu. Before... Yeah. Uh, been inscribed as a world natural heritage site. Yes. Yes, yeah. correct. But were, so, were there any? Were, were you guys staying in long houses then? Uh, no. What type of accommodations to get? I stay at the resort. I'm a luxury traveler at that time. Because <laughs> I yes, love my backpacking. <laughs> in 1998, I spent a uh, total cost of my tour is three thousand ringgit. To Sarawak Ooh. in 1998. I'm a luxury traveler. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? From here, we take a car ride. It's only $30. Yeah. 
Um, and then we take a plane, which costs us eighty dollars Brunei, <laughs> and then we stay in the rooms could be about eighty dollars too. That's all we spend. But again, uh, if you look at it, the guide fees are the one which we pay. I mean, it is only right that we have a guide because you don't want to be wandering our way around because with all the species of animals and, you know, bats, oh, I think I'd rather be safe with a, uh, with a guide around. <laughs> For those who just joining us, if you have no idea what's 3,000 ringgit in 1998, just to give you some idea, in 1998, 3,000 ringgit, we can go to Europe. <laughs> so, yeah, we can go to Europe. So it's not like you visit Sarawak. So when I was there, when I told my friend I'm going to Sarawak, everybody was like, huh, you spend so much money, just go to Sarawak. <laughs> but to be honest, and, uh, until today, I have no regret, okay? I have no regret at all because i seen the most authentic Mulu. So yes. I want to discuss a little bit on the impact, you know, later on when come to the because one question been raised, right? I'll, I'll share you later. I will share with all of you later about the impact. Okay, so I'm going to move on to my another uh, natural heritage site, which is I choose Halong. So if you look at it, how long was been inscribed in the year of 1994? It's very early. In fact, the whole Southeast Asia, the very first uh, heritage site is not natural, but is uh, Borobudo. Borobudo is the first oh, yes. heritage site, UNESCO heritage site in Southeast Asia in way back in the 1980s. They found it in the 70s after the complete is 80s. But Halong Bay is one of the earliest for the natural heritage site because you see Mulu was 2000, right? And Halong was 1994. So I do not know when 1994 or before that, how Halong was looked like. But I was, my first visit was 2016 in Halong, okay, 2016. So uh, to be honest, uh, because if you look at the inscription uh, for the, sorry, the criteria they have been fulfilling is criteria number seven, and criteria number eight. So they are more on, uh, basically is on the landscape, the scenery, and also for the whole phenomena, the whole, uh, I would say that the uh, area views, you know. So when you first, I think, and I, I kind of like understand why this Halong is so popular and famous, you know. Because if you look at Mulu, you need to be physically fit, right? And yes. <laughs> Access to Mulu is not easy at all. Why? Because you can't be hiking. I don't know how many days you require from you. But even the small flight getting in is like, you know, I was traveling like by less than 50. And uh, originally those days when I travel, it's only nine seater. Oh my God, nine seater. Only, yeah. Okay? So, and then, and it's many challenges for you to get in. But for how long is... Uh, when I was there, the highway was not ready. But last year, remember, we back to uh, our Asian Tourism Forum, right? So we were together in Halong, which is in 2019, right? We were there. So what happened was, whoa, we already have highway <laughs> to reach there. So before that, it was Amazing like, view. <laughs> yeah. Before that, I was need like three, four hours to get in. But it's still people, are, you know, people like you know dying to get there the moment you in vietnam you go to hanoi you must visit halong without without me i can understand because number one the weather is fantastic and you are in the cruise ship right and it's like tourism for all <laughs> you know everybody can go all into right. the cruise ship you know so it doesn't require you to climb up and down so much you know you enjoy the scenery so i can understand why halong is always that popular okay and uh i managed to sleep one night <laughs> i joined the two days one night you know in the cruise ship but uh the only a little bit um that i feel disappointed is because of i do not get much understanding about how long you know because i feel like in order for us to understand how long uh, this is something like mulu you can get a tour Okay, you can get mm -hmm. a good tour and you can join the different, different tour in the different levels of your requirement. But in Halong, usually it's like a rest and relax. <laughs> okay, <laughs> most of the time, rest and relax. And then you don't learn much about the formation, you know, and all this. It's not being like um, very detailed, but 
unless you read, you know, it's required a lot of reading. And sometimes we are not major from that. It's quite hard for us to understand. We still need people to pointing us out, like how hmm. this formation and why make it the outstanding universal value, you know, that it's a, because for me, outstanding universal value is an education. It's a very Correct. strong, yeah, it's a strong education element for the whole world must know, okay? So this is a little bit, uh, I'm a little bit disappointed with how long. I don't get the right personnel, <laughs> okay, to, <laughs> to guide me along. But scenery, the cruise service, you know, I know the tourist guide is work very hard to make fun, you know, to make us feel like enjoyable. I really appreciate that. I really appreciate that. But it's just that I require more. <laughs> okay. So that's why now I tell everyone go to Halong. Uh, if you couldn't get like a edu real education tour, then you can just join the daily, you know, just the daily cruise will do, which is I advise you to do that. <laughs> you know, it's and good Halong enough. food are lovely. <laughs> you, you can actually get oh, nice yeah. seafood in Halong uh, yes. and things like that. But yeah. what I fell enough about Halong is frankly, remember we were rowing in and we went through the, at that time there were no paddy. They have the yep. water paddy that they were yep. growing. That is yep. quite unique if you look at it. And you see people uh, are always in water, moving from mm. place to place in water, either the whole body or just mm. by boat moving around. And mm. um, the boatmen are, you know, I think they are trained, <laughs> yeah, trained <laughs> to be very hospitable. And yes, very interesting, yes. very good photographers too, if you look at it. Yeah. They can yeah. take us on the right angle to take photos. All right? Yeah, correct, so correct. Halong is a must. I think Halong is definitely a must because of the land formation. But as you yeah. were saying, if you don't have a guide, you won't understand it. But I was yeah. so lucky when I went there because I had a guide, which is you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> 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 So that is was one something um, people don't understand, like why Siga keep talking about integration, right? Then we are talking yeah. about like um, among the 10 tourist, 10 country tourist guide, we must work united and we must sharing yes. our knowledge and skill because, yes. because that is how one of the way to make the tourism in SDGs. <laughs> Yes, you correct. Know, sustainable. <laughs> yes, correct. Yeah. The, the thing being uh, with Sega is we come from each individual country. Yeah. And we are trained in this area and are passionate in there. And yeah. we understand why we need to interpret it properly to get yeah. rich to the others, not just pointing this, 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 but to yeah. let them understand and we go yeah. back satisfied. Correct. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> but before before I get um a fine or I've been uh, suspended, I better declare myself. I'm not doing a guiding. Okay. I'm not doing guiding there. But yes, I'm just correct. sharing my information and my knowledge to anybody who requires it. So sometimes I say that I can be a, a tour manager, but I cannot be a tourist yes. because I'm not a Vietnamese. Correct. I'm not a Vietnamese. Correct. So I still have to respect the local. You know, I yeah. still need to make sure that local able to upkeep, you know, their their job titles. Yeah. <laughs> yes, that, that's that's about right. Uh, so when we go into these places, we already have people in hand who understand yes. what certain people need, and yes. we are not the expert in this area, but we help yeah. them to understand what they need to cover, and yeah. so it makes people understand and come back to you to help yes, you know yes, to yes. to make people understand your country better. They're yeah. correct. I'm not a guide in those countries. But it's nice <laughs> to share information. Yeah. Yeah. But, <laughs> correct. But unfortunately, sometimes I have to act like a guy also. <laughs> 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 which is I know it's wrong. Which is I know it's wrong. But I do to I respect the local guys. Seriously. I really still respect yeah. them. And I always tell them, I'm just your manager. I'm just your tour manager. I'm coming here to assist you, you know, to help you to All make right. sure you complete your job and your task in the satisfaction way. Okay, I think um almost time running very fast, uh, Cam. Usually when I come to you, I don't know why the time really flies, right? So we have to reserve. Because a we are happy. Yeah, we are happy. 
<laughs> because we read once a month. <laughs> okay, so we're going to quickly go through some uh, question. You know, maybe some answering from you and some could be answering from myself. So it's uh, show the responsibility as the frontliners. Okay, how to show the responsibility as the frontliners, especially in the UNESCO site. Yeah, especially in the UNESCO sites. Okay, so what do you think? I mean, for me, uh, uh, I personally... For, yeah. For me, I personally, okay, yeah. whoever wants to work at the UNESCO site, please, you must go through at least some short courses or the workshop mm. to understand the importance of the UNESCO. Okay, the importance of yeah. the UNESCO and why this site, you have an mm. outstanding universal value and how yes. we as a frontliner to protect them, you know. You know, that is yeah. the responsibility. It's a must. <laughs> it's a must. <laughs> yes. Uh, th th that's why I thought too, because certain areas like, even though everybody is a guy or mm. somebody is certified, you need to be certified to understand that you, what are these criteria so nobody else can come in and understand it. So yeah. I always tell people, leave it to the local, to be a local guide or to mm. be a guide for those areas because they understand it better. They are the mm. living heritage of those areas. Mm. Yeah, traditionally they know what have been happening in those areas. One good example is Halong Bay. Yeah, mm. those people must have been staying there through generations. The same with yeah. Mulu. Imagine you put those people in Halong Bay into Mulu. My God, they'll be sweating away because there's a lot <laughs> of caves to be moving in and walking and hiking. So I no, 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 one, one is by the sea. Now it's by the mountain. You know, <laughs> by the land and yeah. the other one. Is the sea. <laughs> yes, correct. So, so different. So, get yeah. your training properly done. Yes, correct, correct, correct. Yes. I'm not saying like uh, only foreigner is good or only the local is good. Yeah, but no, yeah. yeah, but the importantly is get our knowledge correct, mm -hmm. you know, especially in correct. the UNESCO site. That's very important. Okay, can I have yes. the next question now? So, the next question I think we're going to have is about the positive and negative impacts caused by the tourism. I think from the discussion we have or the introduction, I think we do mention, right? So yeah. I always I always say the word capacity control, especially UNESCO site. Okay, capacity mm. control is very, very important. Otherwise, the negative definitely <laughs> will be more than the positive. Okay, what about oh, you? <laughs> I, would, I would say thank God to COVID. It's giving <laughs> some of these sites some time to take a break. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, for one good example is Mampushi when we yeah. were up in uh, Long Prabang. I think mm. if you were not careful, you feel as if you're falling off from that mountain because mm. of the overcrowding of people and you basically can't walk in those yeah. areas. I think it has to be controlled. That's the negative side. The positive mm. side is we got to learn the heritage. Mm. Uh, again, I have to uh, share this with you about Nepal. The crowd of people itself make you scared. Mm. Make you scared whether a hey, are we gonna we are definitely not gonna be banged down by cars, but we will be rammed down by a herd of people who mm. wants to walk together. So mm. that's that. Yeah, that's the worst part of it, the negative part. But the you remind me. Yes, you you actually reminds me when you mentioned that when I was in Hui An, you know, when I was in mm. Hui An, um, the first night I checking in and I feel so regret. I already regret. It's not I hate Hui An. Uh, don't get me wrong. I love Hui An. I love the city. Mm. I love the town township. You know, I love the um, atmosphere. But I can tell you, just like you feel like, you know, the city capacity is only like maybe for 10,000 people. Example. Okay. And then suddenly you have 100,000 people in there. <laughs> oh my God. They are hanging out of the window. <laughs> so can, can, can you feel the crowdedness? You know, the crowdedness. Yeah. And then like you say now in COVID-19, the whole world pandemic. So it reminds me, it's like, oh my God. You know, sometimes I look at, okay, this place is crowded. I don't want to visit. You know, I don't want to put myself into the reach. So I think it's a time for the tourism sector. Okay. Or mm -hmm. even the policy holder that uh, the operators, the tourism operators also, they have to think about it, seriously think about it, you know, how to draw, you know, to make a safety. The safety, when I mentioned here, is the capacity control also, you know, for the sustainable yeah. development. Yeah. Okay. And okay, also, so uh, 
Sites like this needs a short break. Uh, it needs a break <laughs> yeah. away from people. I, I'm not trying to say what is the 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 people who are staying within the area itself. Yeah, yeah, true, you know, true. Um, tempo might be short when you keep on people knocking on your door, people knocking on your door, and you wonder what do they want. But actually, they just yeah. lost or something, or they just need something because we have different type of people who are traveling. Yeah, so, yeah. yeah. Now you remind me. I wanted to go back to Komodo. <laughs> Because last year I went to Komodo in Indonesia. It's also another world natural heritage site. So I feel like going back to see how the Komodos uh, live well or not. <laughs> because I feel when I was there, the Komodo, it looks like, you know, okay, you bunch of people, you know, you guys keep coming and entertain me, <laughs> you know. <laughs> it gave me a feeling, it's like, oh my God, it's like I going there to entertain. You know, they were like, they were just crawling like this. Oh, why you guys are here again? You know, how long? You guys <laughs> <laughs> I can't. I can't see much about the the uh, the creature itself, the Komodo dragon itself. That the real characteristic, you know, I can't. You know, I can't. So I think maybe after the pandemic, I seriously I want to go back to see the Komodo dragon. How they going to act? <laughs> this time I want to follow. Okay, great. I want to stay so, a bit go, longer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Can we go to the next question? So how the pandemic have affected the heritage? Oh, I think Cam just say, right? Like, everybody have a good yeah. break now. <laughs> a great yes. break. It, it, it is sad that, you know, when we have tourists, that's when you have sustainable income. Yeah. 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 And yeah. it is also sad that there's no sustainable income for people who run their businesses around it or even the tourist guide. Mm. Okay. Uh, but I think now it has happened. We have to look into a new SOP. Yes. How yes. Could we work? Yeah. yeah. Mm. We need a new SOP in case we have another type of pandemic. We are ready. Yeah. Correct. Correct. And Readiness. also, I think, I think all the heritage sites are so fragile. Seriously, they are so fragile yeah. because it's not easy to keep them for long you know it's not easy yeah so i think the word better normal like we keep saying that you know yeah. it's the time for us to keep the good plan really execute the good preservation conservation plan the management plan i think this is the right time now so you know we need yeah. to change this for good yes that's for sure okay yeah. so <laughs> we need a new bcp yeah and then i think now as a tourist guy also with this pandemic it's also give you a good break, you know. So it's a time like you should upgrade, you know, keep upgrading, you know, improve your knowledge, upgrading your skill. It's also like I'm they now weaving. The, <laughs> yeah. And then you can become the specialist guy, you know, you can really work into the heritage sites, you know. So yeah. that is why that is why I'm keep encouraging people like must go, must go, keep upgrading, don't give up. Yeah, don't give up. Yeah. Okay, can we go into the next question? Uh, incorporate with sustainability her in heritage tourism. Yes, of course. So I think in SIGA, what we have done is in our training, you know, we, we came out, we came out the, uh, uh, the modules, we're talking about uh, mm. interpretation plan, you know, how to improve mm. on your interpretation skill, and then why we emphasizing on the OUV values that we need to understand well, especially for the uh, nature, I mean, sorry, for the UNESCO heritage, you know, for the UNESCO mm -hmm. listed in the UNESCO right. heritage. So this is all we are really look into that the achievement on the tourism for SDGs. So of mm -hmm. course, that is a big scope, but I think the first we should start on all the heritage sites that uh, create yeah. the big, great impact, you know, the awareness, not just the awareness, but the execution. So I think when we done our training on our, this is called the, uh, our SIGGA training. So we just run pa bang. <laughs> so every time our SIGGA training, I always say that we want to have a UNESCO site. It doesn't matter is cultural, it could be natural, and also doesn't matter is tangible, but intangible as well. So that's why we always look into the training venue. Okay. But I think this is also one of the SIGGA initiative. Uh, that currently, I hope, I hope in the future, all our trainers will do the same as well to train your local guides. At least start with now we can't do anything. I mean, we can't visit the site or cross border, but at least we can start input them the heritage value. Yeah. 
So what yeah. about can, can you have something to say? Yeah. Uh, one thing I learned about Long Prabang when we did the training was it's all there. Mm. Not like some places, uh, they they might have the sites, but they don't have rooms. Mm. Like Halong Bay. Yeah. Mm. Uh, when we did this training, we have everything to see. Every day is something different, but it's yeah. all there. So easy mm. within reach. So if mm. you're looking for a site for training, please bear that in mind. So easy <laughs> access. So you don't have to yeah. actually go too far. Imagine yeah. if we were in Borobudo. Yeah. I mean, it's so close to the places that we stay, but it's still a distance to move in and out, yeah. right? To get cars in and out. But in yeah. Long Prabang, we're right there. Spot yes. in the center, and we're next to a what? We're yeah. next to a pagoda or a temple. Then down the river, we're next to that what? Nam Khan? Khan Nam? Yeah. That, that yeah. river. And you see mm -hmm. how the fishermen sustain their livelihood from that river. So exactly. things like that must be put in consideration so it's easier. Or also... Yeah. Mm. Must make sure there's bakery in case hungry. <laughs> <laughs> but I think the most important is still the best practices. The best practices yes, is not right. coming from the uh, authority, but also we yeah. are talking about the local. How the local, local behavior is very important too. Because we need yeah. a good model, you know, to share. Yeah. Okay. Correct. So correct. I think we come to the last question now. Yeah, we come to the last question. Yeah. So, message to the frontliners. <laughs> Be strong. So, it's not a question, it's a message for the ending. <laughs> Be strong. I, I think every day is a learning uh, process. Uh, never yeah. stop learning because never stop understanding. Like, like now, as a tourist guide, we are all out of job, I would say. Most of us are not working. But there are yeah. ways of earning, yeah? You learn. You can go into school to help uh to do charity work you can also learn how to sew and become an <laughs> entrepreneur or become a yeah. chef but mm. at the same time go ahead and learn make sure mm. whatever you're learning it has business linkages to tourism mm. and it will also uh it'll be a nice contact point for you yeah i think the message here is upgrade you know mm. so always believe yourself trust yourself and you are rooms of the opportunity to keep you upgrading. I think that yes. is the message. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Upgrade, yeah. Don't downgrade, please. Upgrade. <laughs> keep upgrade. Okay. All right. Go higher and higher. <laughs> okay. So, Ken, thank you so much for your time, you know. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. I'll then, see you uh, soon. Yeah. I hope next month when we meet again, we got like yes. at least ten, um, even smile or laughter. Like okay, finally travel bubble is going because now I think everybody is looking forward travel bubble, travel bubble. When can we start the travel bubble? You but know? you know what? Let, let's talk about this travel bubble. Your country is bigger than mine. You have so many <laughs> states to travel. Ours is only district, so we make the most of it. So you know what? You know again, I love you, COVID, in a way. It helps to sustain the local people here. Money yeah. is here. Money yeah, is yeah. within a country. Yeah, uh, I love your country, but it's just too far. Um, yeah. yeah, we are keeping safe here and we're teaching yeah. people how to save. But it yes. doesn't stop some people from traveling. Uh, yeah. We do, our borders are open for yes. special travels only to do with our work. That's it. Yes. And they have to apply yes. for it. Okay? Yes. So, yes. travel bubble soon. I need to travel from here to somewhere. <laughs> this is your bulu bulu. <laughs> so I think I think that's about time already. Yeah. So looking forward to see you. Okay, next month. So next yeah. month, I mean, uh, will be oh interesting rainforest. <laughs> yeah, Arena, I need one photograph. Take a shot. Where's your phone? Oh, take a shot. Okay, your phone. we will get that. We will get our admin to help us. Come take a take a photo. Okay, look at, look at the camera. Hold on, hold on. I my hair. <laughs> da? Done. Done. Thank <laughs> you so already. much. Yeah, well, let's talk about rainforest. We have different rainforests. Yeah. Everyone, yeah. we'll see you. Stay safe. Yeah. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 <laughs> okay, bye.